So what we're going to talk about today, we want to keep rose growing fun and easy. We can get into a lot of different chemicals and a lot of different ways to do things, a lot of different fertilizers to use, but we want to keep this simple because I think one, one gardening plant, if you had to choose one that really causes a lot of people anxiety <clears throat> or a reason not to garden, they think that's roses. But we're here today to tell you that you can grow good roses with a minimum amount of tools and a minimum amount of money that you'll spend. Now, by saying that, I can also tell you that once you uh, become a member of the Rose Society, there are many Rose Society members that would be more than happy to sit down with you to empty your wallet and your bank account. So uh, just keep that in mind that we will be glad to have, if you've got too much money, we can definitely help you get rid of that through some of the uh, other chemicals and fertilizers. But what we're going to talk about today is keeping it easy, simple, cost-effective for you because this is a hobby. This is not something that, uh, that we're teaching you today about how to go out and make millions of dollars selling your roses to uh, wholesalers and florists. We're just talking about the home gardener. That's what we're going to get into today. Keeping it easy, learning as much as you can from all you can learn, but just keep in mind, you can't, I don't know anyone that can do everything that everyone tells you. What I do, may be a different way to grow from Ed Lewis. It may be a different way to grow from James Richardson. It may be a different way to grow from Sandra Walls. But if there's something I tell you the way I do it, and they tell you the way they do it, if you think, hey, that sounds more reasonable for me to do, then that's the one you should do, whatever works best for you. Because we can all tell you how we do something, and probably nine out of 10 ways are going to be different. But we usually have the same, uh, at, at the very end, we usually have the same thing. We have the beautiful blooms that we like to share with people and show in row shows. So today I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, John, I think, has turned it over to me. And we're going to go ahead and get into the presentation today. I have um, slides for you. Uh, can I just get someone, John, can you see my screen about a dozen things you need to grow good roses? Not quite yet. Hit share screen. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Hey, everyone. This is my first Zoom meeting as well. Um, John and I had a practice yesterday, but evidently I failed that. So bear with me a minute. Here we go. Now you're seeing my screen with about a dozen things you need to grow roses, right? There you go. Perfect. Hold on. Let me move you all up. Okay. Eat. Uh, often throughout this presentation, too, I'm going to show you some roses that we as members recommend as good roses to grow in our area. Some of you that may be on the phone today are thinking, I would like to plant some miniature roses in pots, or I would like to plant some hybrid tea roses to get that perfect bloom um, that, that I like to see, like the florist cell, or I just like to have a shrub rose that gives me a lot of roses that I can cut. So I'm going to show you different roses. These are not the only roses, of course, that we recommend, that these are just a few to throw out to you today to whet your appetite in case you start looking for roses early. This is Bee's Knees. It's a miniature rose. It's a yellow uh, miniature rose with a pink edge. And as we go along further in presentation, you will see how you can actually see different colors of roses. This rose growing in my garden may be a little bit lighter or a little bit darker than something someone else is growing it. And we'll talk about how to do that as we go along. So let me tell you the first thing of your, uh, about a dozen things you're going to need to grow good roses, you're going to need a calendar and something to write with. Now, and the reason I say that, the older I get, the, the less I remember. 
I can tell you what I had for breakfast this morning because it's only been a couple of hours. Uh, probably if you ask me next week what I had on Saturday, I wouldn't know. Probably if you ask me next week what I fed my ro when I fed my roses last, I would more than likely have to go to my calendar to see when I fed my roses or maybe when I sprayed my roses or when I pruned my roses. This calendar is very handy for you to keep. I keep mine beside a table at my recliner and every evening I'll pull it out while I'm maybe on a TV commercial or something or in between getting something to eat. Uh, I'll pull my calendar out and I will jot down some notes in my calendar of what I did that day. If you look in the lower right hand corner, you see I sprayed my roses with and it tells what I sprayed them with. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Why it's important not only to know when you sprayed your roses, but what did you use the last time you sprayed them? And we'll get into that a little further. But I keep all my information. If I plant a new rose bush, I like to write it down in my calendar. So if I may forget the name of it, I can go back at least and look in the calendar and say, oh, I planted these in uh, February. Let me go back and look and see what they were. And then when they start blooming, I can tell, oh yeah, that red rose, let me go back to February. It is such and such. So calendar comes in very handy, not only for roses, but any of your other gardening uh, uh, information that you'd like to keep in there. But that's very important to me. One of the most important things that I think you should have is a calendar. Here's another beautiful rose. This is a mini flora rose. A mini flora rose is a cross between a miniature rose and a floribunda rose. Uh, gives you a lot of different blooms there. As you can see, this particular one looks like a hybrid tea. Uh, it's a little bit, the blooms are a little bit larger than a miniature rose, but they are smaller than most floribunda roses. But that foolish pleasure, if I had to pick one mini flora rose, that personally would be the one that I would choose. It's a great grower. Uh, I have three of those bushes and uh, they really give a lot of blooms throughout the year. The next thing that you that's of utmost importance would be a water source. Roses love water. If you were to plant a rose bush and do nothing to it in a year other than making sure it had an adequate amount of water, you would get a lot of beautiful blooms. Now, there are other things we do to them to keep them growing and to keep them blooming, but water is so important. And a lot of people say, oh, that's very expensive to put in an automatic water, watering system. You don't have to have an automatic watering system. You, I have hands-on watering and I have about 125 rose bushes. And when I say hands-on watering, I have a faucet near my garden that I hook a water hose to and I water my roses. It's important that your roses have five to seven gallons of water per week per rose bush or about an inch of rain. Another reason to have that calendar so you can go back to see when was the last time it rained and how much rain did we have. If we had a half inch a week ago, then you know your roses are going to need three or four gallons of water in addition to the rain they've had. And people say, well, I've got a garden hose, but how do I know they're getting a gallon or two gallons of water or whatever? I have, if you notice there, that White House vinegar jug, that's a one gallon jug. You can use a milk jug or whatever, but turn your, put your faucet in a one gallon jug, turn your water faucet on wide open, your hose, what your hose is attached to, turn that hose on wide open, stick it in that gallon, time it for how long it takes to fill that gallon jug. And then you can multiply that by five and that will tell you how long it would take for you to give your roses five gallons of water at one time. Now, a lot of people recommend that we do this a couple of times a week. The, they like a deep root watering but you know, if you give them five gallons all at one time, that's going to run off pretty quickly. But at least a couple of times a week, give them a couple, two and a half, three, four gallons of water. And you can just time it while you stand there. It doesn't take me long at all. I think I can do two gallons of water in about 20, 25 seconds. So you multiply that by each bush, you're spending a very little amount of time watering. If you do have the automatic uh, sprinkler and you don't know how much water they're getting at a time, you can put maybe uh, some type of container under a section of your 
uh, watering system there, the pipe or your emitter and turn it on. And once that particular, whatever you have under, whether it's a one gallon pot or a quart jar or whatever catching the water, you can multiply that and determine the amount of water. But like I said, water is one of the most important things that you can give your roses. And if you give them a lot of water, you'll have a lot of roses. A lot of people will say, well, I water mine ever so often, but I'm not getting that many blooms. Well, they, they like the water and to get a lot of blooms, you're going to need a lot of water. These were two arrangements that were uh, exhibited at one of our um, rose shows here in Winston-Salem. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Spraying. A lot of people say, I, I wanna grow roses, but I don't want to spray them. I'm more of an organic gardener. There are some roses that are classified as easy care roses. Um, can you grow them without spraying them? You can grow them without spraying them, but I can tell you that by midsummer, all the leaves are going to fall off of them or the majority of the leaves are going to fall off of them. Uh, and by fall, your roses are going to be about the size of a quarter to a 50 cents. They, uh, roses just need spray because they attract or they get the many diseases such as black spot. Black spot is one that we want to keep away from them. And talking about a sprayer here, you can have notice in the right uh, side of the screen there, lower right, you've got the little $1 hand pump sprayer. You can use that. You can go up to a bigger one gallon or two gallon pump sprayer. You can even go up to a battery operated or electric sprayer, four, 12, 24 gallons. So any type of sprayer that you want is fine, but that is something that you will need. Here's some more roses that uh, you can see. These have been sprayed, no insect damage. Um, the leaves on them, what leaves you can see are beautiful. Those are mixed with some dahlias in there, but just to let you see some of those roses. Chemical feed. There are two types of feed that we normally use with the roses and that's chemical and organic. And the chemical feed, our first feeding, once you prune your roses, you're telling them, as I mentioned on Thursday and Friday, once you prune your roses, you're telling them, okay, begin to grow. That's what it's telling them. If you wanna live now, I've cut you back, you've got to send out new growth. The first feeding should have a high number for the first number in the ratio, 1899. You can use 1055, you can use 201010. That first number is for nitrogen and the nitrogen is going to get the leaves to start growing. So that's the first thing we want to feed is feed that rose bush so those leaves can start coming out. Then after that, to keep things simple, rotate once a month with some 10, 10, 10. You can get that at Walmart, Lowe's, any local gardening company, uh, Clemens Milling Company, any milling company. But I recommend to keep it simple, give them about the large roses, give them a cup of 10, 10, 10 one week, feed them liquid fertilizer. And we'll talk about that in a minute the next week and 10, 10, 10 another week. A lot of people say, well, I've planted my rose bush and they bloomed really well at the beginning of spring, but I haven't had many roses. And we say, do you feed them? Well, no, I haven't fed them. Well, they like to eat just like the rest of us. So the more you feed them, the more blooms that you will have and the larger the bushes will be and the better the leaves will be. If this is quietness, this is a shrub rose. You see all the uh, different blooms on one stem there. That's a great shrub rose if you like cut flowers. Fungicide, and we talked about roses need to be sprayed. Uh, we spray for two reasons. We spray a fungicide to prevent getting what we're trying to keep away, the fungi, the black spot, the powdery mildew, the downy mildew, the rust, the botrytis, any of the uh, fungi that the roses can get, we want to spray on a regular or consistent basis to make sure that we don't get these diseases. This is not to eradicate them. Once you get them, it takes a lot more work to get rid of them than it does if you just spray on a weekly basis. Plan a day of the week that you want to spray, mark it in your calendar and just know, hey, on this day, I've got to find 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, 20 minutes, whatever it's going to take to spray your roses and spray them. 
it's always a good idea to rotate with two types of fungicide. That just keeps the plant from becoming immune to one. I use, and this picture shows Bannermax, that's no longer on the market, but if you notice below there, I have the types Honor Guard, that's the same as Bannermax used to be. Now, Honor Guard says that you can spray every up to every 21 days. I still spray every seven days. Uh, and I mix it with either like a diphane, which you can order that online, or you can get that at some of the local garden shops, or Mancazev or Manzate, just any type of uh, chemical bio advance now, which was Bayer, they have different uh, fungicides at Lowe's and Walmart that you can get, just as long as you have two types. And a lot of uh, rose growers say one should be a contact spray, which means you have to get it on all the leaves. And one is a systemic, which goes in through the roots or through the leaves. As long as you're rotating with two, I have found it does not matter. I use two of the um, systemic. So whatever you want to use, just get you two types of uh, fungicide and it doesn't matter what the cost is, as long as they are, it will say on the bottle to prevent, prevent is the word, prevent black spot, powdery mildew, downy mildew, it'll list a lot of things, but make sure you look for the word prevent black spot. This is Hannah Gordon. This is a Floribunda that really uh, grows well for me. I love this flower. Uh, beautiful hot pink. This is not uh, as true a color as it is on the bush, but that's one beautiful floribunda. It gives you a lot of blooms. The second thing we spray is an insecticide. And you should only spray insecticides when you're seeing non-beneficial insects or chewing insects, uh, caterpillars, thrip, which are, they get down in your bloom and it will sometimes cause the edges of your petals to turn brown. Some people think that's lack of water, but if you pull an, a rose apart and you see these little insects running around, knock them on paper or something, you see them running around, that's thrip damage, thrips. Uh, aphids, uh, cane borers, we talked about that when we were pruning yesterday, Japanese beetles, cucumber beetles in the fall, they the, look like ladybugs, but they are more of a light green with little black dots on them instead of the red with the black dots. But there list some of the types of uh, insecticides that you can use, orthene, Bayer Complete Insect Control, that's what I use, that's the blue bottle in the middle, I'll tell you about that in the middle. There's ortho bug be gone. There's ortho malathion. Uh, there's uh, liquid seven. There's all types of things. The bear advanced complete insect killer. If you are, um, um, if you don't want to kill all the insects in on your row in your rose garden, don't use that because it kills everything. That's what I use. If you're moving in my roses and you're not a human, you're gonna get killed when I spray. And I, you know, some people don't like that, but that's the way I spray. And I mix my insecticide and my fungicide together when I'm spraying, if I know that I need the insecticide. If I'm spraying for Japanese beetles, and we will talk about that, hold on. If I'm spraying for Japanese beetles, I would mix that little $1 hand sprayer, I would mix up some liquid seven in water and I would just go along the roses along the top and just mist along the top and let it fall down on the blooms and the buds because that's pretty much what the Japanese beetles do when they're flying in, they just flop down on top of the roses. It's rare that you'll find some up underneath the leaves on the bottom of the plant. So again, spraying for insects, insecticides when you see them but spraying your fungicides as a preventative measure. Another thing that's very important to have in your garden, uh, if you have not done a soil test, which I recommend everyone uh, does a soil test. I know it's a lot of work, but hey, it's free in North Carolina certain months of the year. Uh, it's very beneficial to you as a gardener to know what your, your garden needs. But if you have not, uh, done a soil test in November, December, even up into January, I would recommend giving your large roses at least one cup of lime, sprinkle it out around your roses, dig it in with a rake or a hoe or whatever, water it in well. Lime does not move down in the soil very quickly like uh, fertilizer. It doesn't melt 
as much like fertilizer does. So it needs some help getting down into the soil. The ground dolomitic limestone is a really powder, whereas the pelletized, uh, it still has some powder in it, but it is easier to spread as far as uh, not getting all over you. Uh, but either one of these work well. But lime is very important to raise your pH. Roses like to have a pH of above six, but preferably between 6.5 and 6.8. And here are a few roses that you will see that um, uh, are very popular in this area. I'm sure you, most of you have heard of the hybrid tea, Double Delight. They're in the upper right-hand corner. I wish you could smell that. Uh, Francis de Brule also is an old garden rose. It's a tea rose. It's almost burgundy black, the blooms, but a very, very good fragrance. Then in the lower left, Heritage, that's a shrub rose. That's a David Austin rose. A lot of people love David Austin roses. David Austin claims that they are very disease resistant. They are more disease resistant than some of the other roses. They still need spray. I found that if you don't spray them, the leaves will get black spot and they will fall off. But the majority of those roses, if you're looking for fragrance, they are very fragrant. And then another very fragrant rose there in the lower right, Dolly Parton hybrid tea. Hey, Jimmy, someone asked about when you uh, apply the lime. Yeah, you apply the lime and I would recommend, no, if you, if you have not had a soil test, uh, I would recommend applying it November, December, January. Uh, it's a little bit late right now and I'll tell you why. Lime and chemical fertilizer, our 1888 or 101010, we have been told that they counteract or they will not work if you mix them together. Lime needs about three to four months for it to activate the soil to raise the pH. If you add your lime and then add your fertilizer, we understand that the fertilizer, the plant will not take the fertilizer up as well as it would had that lime been applied earlier, okay? And then this just tells, this is just an added into something that I recommend that we need. It is a soil test. It, even if you buy the little inexpensive uh, uh, soil testers from a garden center and want to use those, that's fine. Anything just to let you know whether or not your soil needs lime. If it's low, that's going to tell you. If it's too high, that's going to tell you. It may not give you a perfect reading and, and say, oh, your soil is 6.2 or 6.5 or 6.8. It's going to tell you you're in the five range. I even had a bed one time in the four range and wondered why my roses wouldn't grow above knee high. Um, but it's going to tell you if you're low, it will also tell you if you've done something throughout the year that has made it, made your pH really high. And we don't want that either because they can't, they can't, what the pH does, it allows the roses in that particular soil to be able to take up the nutrients and use them. If it's too low or too high, those nutrients are not being broken down or not being, not being released from the soil well enough that the plants can take the nutrients that they need to grow. So that any way you do it, whether you send it off in the lower right-hand corner, there's the little boxes, whether you uh, do a soil test and take it to the cooperative extension office and let them take it to Raleigh and they'll send you a report. Or if you just use one of the garden center soil testers, just something to test your soil. And someone was asking about expirations on fertilizers. Expirations on fertilizers, I know of none. Um, now the chemicals, we talked a little bit about this yesterday in the gardens as well, as far as expiration dates on chemicals. Of course, your chemical companies are going to give you an expiration date because if they didn't, they wouldn't be selling as many chemicals as they can. Chemical expirations will say maybe a year to two years to three years, or they will say keep them uh, uh, out, in, out of a temperature that's too low or too high. I personally have never had an issue with that. You may have, and if you want to follow those expiration dates, they should have them on the bottle or the container. You can do that. And same with the temperature. <clears throat> Again, uh, I've never had an issue with that. And I normally use my chemicals until they're gone. 
until I've used the last of them. I don't throw them away. If you have the $45 to throw away your three-fourths of a pint of the Honor Guard and buy a new bottle each year, that's up to you, but I use it until it's gone. Unless I start seeing that they're not working, you can tell if you are doing everything you're supposed to, you're following the instructions, but it's not preventing you from getting black spot. Then there's something that's either wrong with the chemical, something wrong with your um, climate, or not climate, but your area. So that may be something that you want to check with one of our consulting rosarians on. We have what's called consulting rosarians in the Rose Society. They have been trained through the American Rose Society. They've taken an eight hour course and been tested to be certified that they can give you rose growing information. I was a consulting rosarian until I uh, became an emeritus status of that, but they can still give you information. They'll even make house calls, socially distanced, uh, but they'll make house calls if you need them. So we've got that information as well. If you like purple roses or as close to purple as they come, this is one that's a pale purple. It's called Melody Parfumé. It's a hybrid tea and one of the uh, more fragrant hybrid teas as well. That's Melody Parfumé. The other type of feed then we recognize once we start, we start out with the chemical fertilizer, which is going to break down in the soil and be taken up. The organic fertilizers are broken down uh, by the microorganisms and the microorganisms normally do not become as active until the soil starts to warm up. So the reason we give the chemicals earlier because the organic feed, if you started feeding the organics in April, once you prune or the end of March, the soil is not really warm enough for the organic feed to start doing any good. So we recommend your second feeding about a month later that you start using some type of organics. You can use the alfalfa pellets or alfalfa cubes. These cubes are the same as the little rabbit pellets that you feed your rabbits. The cubes are just what's fed to horses. Uh, they are much easier to apply, I think, because you can just take a trowel and dig uh, little holes around your roses and bury one, uh, uh, alfalfa cube in different areas around the roses or with the pellets, dig a trench, pour cup, a cup of them around and cover it back up and water well. So either way, but just something organic of that type or some type of barnyard manure. And when we say barnyard manure, cow, chicken, horse, sheep, rabbit, anything like that, not uh, don't take your cat's litter box uh, or take your dog uh, on a walk out through the rose garden and expect that fertilizer to work. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about some type of barnyard manures. But the manures and the organics, I'm gonna show you something here. <clears throat> this is the same rose. This is Paul X Jr. It's a shrub rose. It's one of my favorites. It's a single. The petals on the left, if you notice, and the true color of that is more or less a deep, deep burgundy purple edge on that with a reddish orange center. Very unusual color, but a beautiful, beautiful bloom. One of my favorite color roses. If you look at the spray on the right, these were both from the same rose show. This particular, this rose on the left was not an actual rose, but it came from uh, someone that had one look just like it. The reason the colors of these are different is because of the different type of soil they're growing in. And it's whether or not the pH, more than likely on the left, the pH is between six and 6.5. The one on the right, more than likely, is either below six or the one on the left used more organic fertilizer than the one on the right. James Richardson uses a lot of barnyard manures. His roses, the colors are so vivid um, compared to others in rose shows. And you might talk to two different exhibitors and say, what do you feed your roses? And they say, well, I mostly just give mine 10, 10, 10, and um, I don't give them any type of organics. And you can really see the difference. So if you want those vivid, bright colors, I would recommend giving them some type of organics or using organic um, liquid fertilizer. And we'll talk about that. 
liquid fertilizer. I said rotate that once a month with your 10, 10, 10. Remember, we're keeping this simple. That can be your miracle Grow all-purpose food. It can be k Grow. Is there still a Kmart? I don't know if there is, but Kmart used to have a k Grow. Liquid fish fertilizer. You can make manure teas. Uh, take cow manure or horse manure, put it in a bag or just throw it in a big barrel, fill it with water, let it sit for three or four days, stir it every day or two, whatever, let it sit in that barrel and uh, it will not smell good, but the roses absolutely love it. It's a great food for them. So keep it simple, get you some all purpose plant food or uh, liquid food, just some type of uh, liquid feed is what we recommend every other week. Here's three more roses, that Moonstone up in the upper left, that's a beautiful, it's a white rose with a pale pink edge. Down below is a shrub rose, grows in clusters, a lot of beautiful clusters of white with a real pale pink to peach uh, color. Uh, an entire bouquet of those could be a bridal bouquet because they grow so large. And then there's a miniature, one of my favorites, Purine, it's a orangey pink uh, miniature rose. <clears throat> Now, the way to feed your liquid fertilizer, there's different ways. You can use a sump pump in a barrel and hook it to a hose and water your plants with it. I use the jug and barrel method. Now, the jug and barrel method is I mix mine in a 50 gallon barrel, plastic barrel, and you can get these. We can tell you where you can find these for, I think they were $5 a piece. Now people sell them $10, but cut the top out of it and get your old barrel lid to go on top. Mix your liquid fertilizer in that. Let it sit, like I said, three days up to seven, eight days. It will pretty much rot. I mean, some of these uh, fertilizers that you mix in liquid, they really smell bad, but I can promise you the roses slap their lips together to get that. So I just take a one gallon, as you notice, I took a one gallon milk jug and a vinegar jug and just cut out a little bit of the top just so the water will go in it more quickly. Fill that jug up, walk over to one plant, pour a gallon on, walk over to the other plant, pour a gallon on, go back and do it again. With 100 roses, it only takes a few minutes to do that. And you're only going to do it every other week. So not a lot of uh, work as far as it is feeding them the liquid fertilizer. And to let you know, you may be sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to join a rose society. You know, the, I'm sure there's a lot of people in there have a lot of roses. I told you I have 125. That's about 120 too many, my wife says. But uh, <clears throat> there are formal, we have members who have formal rose gardens that are absolutely beautiful. We have people that have informal rose gardens. They have them planted in pots and in the ground. They are absolutely beautiful. And we have people that grow roses only, I said only in pots. We have one lady that, uh, Pat Helm, I don't know if she's on here or not, but she has, I think it's six or eight, no, it's more than that, probably eight or 10 large pots out in along the edge of her driveway that she has her roses in. She even grows a climber called wedding dress in a pot on a trellis uh, between her garage uh, or at her garage uh, there at her driveway and it's absolute. I've seen all of these in bloom and they do great. I moved some of my roses this year from the ground, some of my miniature roses from the ground into pots and they did the best this year they've ever done. Some of the roses they just did better in pots. Uh, I think it's more controlled environment. It's easier to water. You have to water more often and in the heat of the summer sometimes every day and I know Steve Lawson uh, our first vice president, he waters some of his twice a day because the pots uh, dry out so quickly. But uh, you can grow roses, formal garden, informal garden, in pots. Uh, we can help you with all of that. Some more important rose tools. You need pruners, saws. We say saws. You don't have to have a saw, but you definitely need pruners. They need to be the bypass pruners. That means blades pass each other. There's one called anvil where the cutting blade comes down to a flat blade and presses against the cane. We prefer you do the uh, bypass more like scissors because 
they, the cuts are cleaner and it doesn't open up the outside. We talked about this in the pruning uh, in the gardens this week. We showed where if you use the anvil, it presses the side of the stem. And when you let go, it opens that seal or the skin around the stem and where insects can lay eggs and uh, black spot spores can get in more easily. So it's best to have the bypass pruners. I like those little loppers on the left there, the Corona, I'll show you a better picture of those shortly. Uh, some type of little lopper with a smaller blade at the top. Those are great uh, for two reasons. Uh, the older you get or the bigger your belly gets like mine, you may not be able to bend over as far so you can reach out with those loppers to cut some of those canes. Uh, but they are very sharp. A lot of people were saying in the pruning seminar, do you sharpen your pruners every year? I never sharpen my pruners. My pruners do not need sharpening. I'm using metal to cut a stem. There is no need, <clears throat> there is no reason that, that those blades should need sharpening unless you're cutting rocks or something harder than the metal you're using to cut them with. They need cleaning every year. And if uh, you can't get all the gook or the grime off of them, you can, you, we've, it's recommended to use steel wool, a real fine steel wool or real fine sandpaper to just clean them up and you'll realize once they're clean, those blades will continue to bypass just fine. Now, sometimes the nut on the screw that holds the blades together can get hit or something and it can get a little bit loose that you may have to tighten that. But as far as sharpening your pruners, I've never felt a need to have my pruner sharpened. Now, if you do, you just go right ahead and do that, but, but we've never experienced that. You can pay all kinds of prices for pruners as well. Those pruners there on the right with the red handles, those are Corona pruners. You can get those in Felco or Corona. I think those are Corona, those may be Felco. Anyway, you can get those anywhere. Lowe's has them, I think maybe 20 bucks up to 30, 40, $50. You can get some online, 50, 60, $70, according to what size and uh, who you get them from. They're very good. Those little pruners there beside of them with the black blades, I bought those about 12 years ago from Big Lots for $2 a pair. They're still just as sharp as they were the day I bought them. I bought two pairs, well, I bought, I think, 10 or 12 pairs because I sold them at the Rose Society meeting um, because they were such a good deal and looked to be so sharp, and they are. I keep those, a pair of those in my truck, in my um, Yukon and a pair in the garage just when I'm going out and need a quick something to prune with. I've got those handy. And then that little saw in the middle is a keyhole saw that if you have a great big old cane in some of your roses, we noticed at Renolda we needed to use something like that the other day where some of the old canes, maybe a dead cane that you want to cut out and clean up the bush at the bottom. That's very good to get into those to saw out the uh, larger canes. And you need measuring cups and spoons not to take back in the house to use. Don't borrow your wife's uh, or your husband's cooking utensils and use them in the garden and think, well, I'll just wash these chemicals off and take them back in and we'll fix supper. Don't do that. Buy your own. If you, you can go to Dollar Tree and get an entire set of either one for a dollar. So your chemical, your spoons are used uh, every time you, you spray your chemicals, because there's some type of measurement with your chemicals, your measuring cups are good for uh, applying your fertilizer and your lime when you want to know what particular amount you need or even uh, mixing your liquid fertilizer. There are the Corona uh, pruners I was talking about. They are some of the best that I've ever used. Um, they will cut canes, oh, an inch to an inch and a half 
with very little uh, energy. It really helps your wrists. I know some of the ladies yesterday were having difficulty with the pruners they had. They said, you know, my pruners, I think I need a different type of pruner because it's hard for me to cut some of these larger canes with my hand with these handheld pruners. So I gave them these to try and they were just amazed at how much easier it was to use something like that. Uh, and two, with your longer handles like that, it gives you more room back to squeeze and to push those blades together. Gloves. You need gloves for any time you work in your roses. You need them for spraying. You need them when you're planting and you need them when you're pruning and deadheading your roses. The spraying, you especially need to protect your uh, hands your face, if you wanna wear goggles, maybe you already wear glasses, it's best to wear, it's recommended for a lot uh, that you wear the uh, respirators when you're spraying. Now I'm going to tell you as it should be done and I'm not going to tell you as I do it, I'm just kidding, I will, but I'm not going to allow, allow you to come to my garden while I'm spraying, but you know, use common sense. These chemicals that you're using to spray roses are provided for the home gardener. They are, if you follow the directions and you do what it says and you're careful when you're spraying, you should be fine. Protect your hands, protect your face, protect your nose, even if you wear a little mask of some sort, which we're, we should be used to that by now. But anyway, go out and if, it's, if the wind's blowing, don't spray that day. Or if it's the only day you're going to be able to spray, make sure that you check and see which way the wind's blowing and at least spray where the spray goes on the roses and not back on you. So just use common sense when you're spraying. When you're planting, the reason we say wear gloves when you're planting, remember the ground around these roses, they've had chemical fertilizers applied to them. You sprayed them with chemicals. Anything in the soil, if you have a little cut or a little scratch or whatever, just protect your hands because you don't wanna get any type of infection in your hands. That's, that would be common sense from any time you're working in your garden, it's best to wear gloves. And then of course the deadheading and the pruning because of the thorns and, and cutting your fingers. And what kind of gloves? I would use the plastic glove, the uh, uh, nitri nitrile, Gloves are some type of gloves that are going to keep that chemical from getting into your hand when you're spraying. Those green gloves that Lowe's sells for chemicals are really the best to use when doing that. As far as planting, pruning, and deadheading, some type of thick leathery cowhide glove really works better for me to keep those thorns from coming through. Heritage shrub roses is another reason you need sometimes long pruners and uh, uh, gloves. This particular rose was about seven, eight feet tall, probably had 50 canes coming out of the ground, but it, it was absolutely beautiful in the spring and fall. It was pretty in the summer, but that first flush in the spring and that new flush in the fall, it was gorgeous and great smell. And you always need vases. You need vases because you want to share your roses. That's why we grow them. We grow them for our enjoyment and we grow them to share with others. And that those are very important uh, that you have some vases on hand. Winston-Salem Rose Society Rose Show, a lot of members, this is why they grow the roses. They like to exhibit them. Some only grow them because they want to have pretty roses to go in their homes. Some grow them because they want to share with others. Whatever your reason is, we would love to have you join us. Here is our information. Our annual membership is $15 for a single membership, $25 household. If you're on here today and you would like to join, you can get that address or you can go on our website at www.wsrs.us and you can get the information to become a member there. And you can also follow us on Facebook. We've been posting about this seminar and also the pruning seminar at Renolda. So uh, please follow us on Facebook and uh, come and join us. Our next meeting will be March the 23rd at seven o'clock p.m. And it will be via Zoom. No, I'm sorry. It will be via GoToMeeting which is just as easy for you as it is on Zoom. And Kathy uh, Owen, once you send her the information <clears throat> about joining, she can send you the information about that as well. 
and we are open for questions. Let's see. So I've, I've allowed people to unmute themselves, but I'll go ahead and start. Uh, someone was asking about um, addressing uh, feeding and types of fertilizer and frequency of application again. Um, just sure. I think to rehash that. Sure. Once you prune your roses, that's when you start the process for the year. <clears throat> Once you prune, you start spraying and you start feeding. <clears throat> your first feeding of the year should be a chemical fertilizer like 10, 10, 10, or, you know, we said a higher nitrogen number. You say, I don't have access to a higher no a nitrogen number. That's fine. Get 10, 10, 10. Your large roses, give them one cup of 10, 10, 10, sprinkle it out around them, around the drip line, scratch it in, water it. It's always best to water your roses some the day before you're going to, the day before you're going to feed them because that hydrates the roots, the day before you're going to prune them because that hydrates the stems or the canes, and the day before you're going to feed them because again, that hydrates the roots. So feed them, spraying them, uh, always water them first. So you start out with your high nitrogen, then, uh, the, then that's good for the first, say three or four weeks. Then get on a regular schedule, give them your organic fertilizer, 10, 10, 10, all in one week to get them started with the organics. Then every other week, give them a liquid fertilizer and a cup of 10, 10, 10. Your miniature roses, give them about a half, half of what you're feeding your larger roses. If you're feeding in pots, if you have roses that you want to grow in pots, I personally recommend only giving them liquid fertilizer. And I would do that weekly or bi-weekly to keep it simple for you. Just do it every other week when you're feeding your others. You, someone says, is it too easy? Did it say too easy to prune and feed now? Or too early? Too early. Renolda Gardens is very protected with their trees and they're kind of down in a valley with the banks around it. They have, we've never had a problem pruning at Renolda Gardens in late February, early to mid March, whatever. Um, I personally, my roses are out in a field. They're in the open. There's no protection around them. I personally do not prune until after the 10th of April. That's just a date that one time we pruned early and we had a freeze for two or three days and all of my canes died back. And I thought, I hate pruning in the first place. So why do I want to do it twice? So I, I wait until April. Who else had a question? Let's see, let me get to chat. Here we go, okay. Is it too late to spray lime sulfur spray in a climate zone six area? Uh, Sandra Walls asked that question. Sandra, I will refer you to Larry Wise on that because I do not use lime sulfur and I know he does. Is there anyone, James Richardson, raise your hand if you use lime sulfur. He does not. Ed Lewis, do you use lime sulfur? He does not. Kathy Owen, does Ray use lime sulfur? You're muted. <laughs> You're still mute. We don't, know if, we don't know if he does or not, but I would check with Larry Wise. Another question, if you end up with some time, could you touch on a few rose pruning tips? Uh, we'll come back to that if we have time. Um, tell us the benefit of using Epsom salts. Very good, very good. The benefit of using Epsom salts, we noticed even yesterday at Renolda, and you may have this at home, you have a rose bush that only has maybe one or two canes coming out of the ground and you've got all your growth at the top and you wonder how can I get more canes coming out of the ground. That's one of the things that Epsom salts does for your plant. It encourages new growth. So in the spring, maybe in May, 
Give your large rose bushes about a half to three fourths cup of Epsom salts. Put it with your fertilizer, water it in well, just like you would your fertilizer. For your smaller roses, maybe a half cup. You can even use a little bit of Epsom salts in your potted uh, roses and potted plants and other plants. It will green up the growth that you're already getting and it will encourage new growth, new growth from the bottom. I know it does on roses and it may even from the top, but yes, thank you. Is it every other week for chemical, then organic or every other month? I would start with chemical and then when you give them the 10, 10, 10, I would give them some organic food with the 10, 10, 10. At, I'd give them the organic at least once a month. I think James Richardson would probably say once a week will not hurt if you have it. <coughs> uh, this was, let's see, uh, how about reviewing initial planting of bare root roses? Um, bare root roses, there's, uh, there's an entire program on planting roses, and that's going to be our topic for our March meeting on the 23rd. Thank you, Ed Lewis, for bringing that up, um, and we'll get that information out. But it's going to be how to plant a potted rose bush and how to plant a bare root rose. So join us March 23rd for that on how to plant those, okay? Uh, we used to enhance the color of blooms as well, yes. Uh, if we here at Ernolda prune this early, should we wait a couple of weeks to add a high nitrogen fertilizer, say after April 10th? <clears throat> Forrest, um, it would probably be good because even though we pruned yours and they're gonna start growing, they're not going to start growing really well until the weather warms up more. Uh, you've got a little bit of growth now on most of them. I do not think it will wait. I will not hurt to wait a few more weeks to feed them, but I would go ahead and start the spraying process as soon as you can, because you do have some little leaves. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Nancy uh, Janeway says, if lime sulfur spray can't be used now, Sandra, if Larry says it's probably late to do that, she says, try light year-round oil. <coughs> light year-round oil. Should you invite all these people to join us for Mar? Oh, never mind. Um, let's see. Anti-desiccant sprays are good. Can you overfeed roses? Um, probably. Just like we can be overfed. Uh, you can probably overfeed them. That's why I say limit it to about a cup per bush every other week for your chemical fertilizer. I don't think you can probably give them too many organics uh, or too much of the liquid, but the chemical fertilizer, you could probably do damage to them, probably burn the leaves and the roots. Um, what else we got? Oh, anti-desiccant spray. That is like your wilt proof sprays. And, and these are things that others use in the society that once you get in and uh, the society and start talking to more people, you'll find out about a lot of the different sprays and a lot of different fertilizers. Again, keeping it simple, stick with your 10, 10, 10 and some liquid fertilizer. And when you can get organics or get some uh, alfalfa pellets or whatever, and you want to give them. Rose Tone is another organic product that is good uh, to give your roses. Um, just as long as you're feeding them something about every week is very important and making sure that they get the amount of water. Water, spray, and feeding in that order is very important to have good roses. And someone said, uh, a drop of Dawn in a spray bottle with water uh, keeps aphids off roses. You don't even have to use Dawn. If you just turn your water faucet or your water hose on and put it on a strong spray and just spray it over the buds, if you have aphids, it will wash it. It'll blow the aphids off and they, they can't crawl back up before they die uh, like that. In your spray, when you're mixing your spray, I use a, a spreader sticker if you can find Dove dishwashing detergent, is it Dove dishwashing detergent, James Richardson? You remember? 
uh, I, I think it's dove. Um, no, 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 no. It's ivory. If you can find the non non fragrant or non smell ivory dishwashing detergent, when you mix your chemicals in your water, you can put a couple little drops of that in there. And what that does is when you spray your leaves then with that water, you know how sometimes when you spray water on anything, it'll just bubble up on your leaves. This dishwashing detergent or a spreader sticker, which you can buy spreader sticker, but the dishwashing detergent's less expensive. That will form a film more or less on the leaves. It will keep the water from beating up and it will form a film over the water with your chemicals and your water, which is a better coverage. Another thing very important and very quickly, uh, I know we're running out of time if we haven't run out of time. Uh, another very important thing is when you uh, spray your roses, when you mix your spray and you spray your roses, pour whatever's left out out. Don't use that the next week. That becomes water after about an hour or two. If you read your bottle and it says that this product, once you spray it, as long as it doesn't rain within an hour or as long as it's on for two hours before rain, it's okay. That's pretty much how long that's good once it's in the water. So if you mix up your gallon of spray and you only use half of it and next week you get that spray out with that leftover uh, mix in it and you go out and spray your roses, you're spraying it with water. Okay, that's why a lot of people will say, I spray my roses every week, I'm still getting black spot. And I'll say, walk me through how you spray them. And they'll say, well, I mix my chemicals in my water. I go out and spray them. When I finish, I put my uh, sprayer up and I say, wait a minute, did you wash your sprayer out? And then the next week, Nick, no, I had spray, spray left. Why would, I, why would I mix up more? It's no good after you spray it the first time. Some people say that's such a waste to me. I only have four rose bushes and it says one tablespoon per gallon of water. Here's what you do. Get you one of those little hand pumps, which is probably a pint, maybe a quart. Let's say it's a quart. And it says a tablespoon of chemical per one gallon of water. So a quart of water, you would need a quarter of a tablespoon or about a little over a teaspoon of chemical in your quart of water. Mix that up and spray it. There's no need to spray a gallon if you have one, two, or three roses. There's no need to go out and buy a four gallon battery operated sprayer if you have five rose bushes. Keep it simple, keep it inexpensive, and we'll help you do that. Someone was asking about um, when watering, should getting water on the leaves buds be avoided? If you have a consistent spraying program, there is no problem getting your rose leaves wet. We used to, people would tell rose growers, don't let your roses get wet. Well, when we have rain, guess what? Our rose leaves get wet. So yes, you can get your rose leaves wet. That's no problem. As long as you have a consistent spraying program. And even though your bottle of spray may say, I can go 14 to 21 days, don't risk it stick with seven and rotate. And here's another thing, when I said rotate, here's the way I rotate my sprays. I have two different types of sprays, spray one and spray two. One week I spray with just spray one, that chemical mixed with my water. Week two, I spray with that same chemical and I add spray two to my water. The next week I go back to spray one. The next week I go to spray one and spray two. Any way you want to mix it up, even if you want to do spray two one week and then the next week do spray one and then the next week mix them, that's okay. Just constantly do something different with your sprays. Supposedly that keeps them from getting immune to one particular spray because they don't know from one week to the next what you're going to be spraying with. Um, I recommend watering I mean, I recommend feeding and spraying in the cooler time of the day, or especially you're spraying in the cooler time of the day, maybe the morning. Avoid spraying late in the evening when it won't have time to dry before the dew falls for two reasons. The dew will dissipate a lot of the spray. And second of all, 
the it will stay on more overnight and not dry. So you want that spray to dry as quickly as possible as well. Do not spray when the temperature is above 85 degrees. Now this summer, you're going to think, my God, we've got two months and it's above 85. I just mean in that particular time of the day. So that morning you can start spraying if it's 80 degrees at nine o'clock, go ahead and start spraying. Spray your roses at nine o'clock in the morning, 9.30. It's always good to try to let as much dew dry off of them as you can, but you're going to probably get enough spray on them anyway that it's going to wash the dew off and you'll still have enough on. Someone said, is the liquid seven a large risk to bees? Yes, but if you spray early in the morning with liquid seven or late in the evening when they are less active. Remember, you're just going to be lightly misting the top of your roses uh, with that liquid seven. That's the best time. Someone said, can we use powder uh, liquid seven? They've asked that before. I mean, powder seven, can you use that? Yes, you can. I, I just use the liquid seven because it leaves less residue. Still some residue, but not like the powder. And I know we have bombarded you with a lot of information today. Uh, a lot of people that are new, to, maybe to growing roses or new to the society, we don't mean to do that. It's just, we like to share information. And again, I said, keep it simple, follow what works best for you, take all this information in. But if nothing you remember other than water, spray and feed to have good roses, those are three very important things that you'll need. I think we're good. I, I haven't seen any more questions come in. It has been a wonderful uh, and informative session, Jimmy. And I think this, this highlights the importance of having some of these plant groups in our community, um, the, having the resources of the Rose Society here. We value them uh, helping out here at Renolda Gardens. Um, I know Jimmy's got a uh, a side venture that he's trying to get going of, uh, if you love dahlias, uh, reach out to Jimmy because he's uh, he's looking to start a dahlia society here. Um, I know Ronaldo would be lo would love to, I know Forrest especially would love some dahlias. We have a little uh, running joke about Forrest with dahlias here, but um, we wanna, I'd love to add more in the gardens here. Um, they're just fantastic to, to have in the garden. And I think it'd be fun to have an, a society here for that. But uh, I will, I have recorded the talk and I'm gonna put it up on the uh, Renolda Gardens YouTube channel. So if you wanna go back and review this, it's gonna be there as a resource. Um, but- Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, oh yeah, well, and thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we, uh, we did have one, of course, one more question snuck in. Uh, do you seal cut stems to prevent stem borers? Someone asked about that during the pruning this both days. Um, uh, some people use Elmer's wood glue. It's kind of a, a brown looking glue that you can buy at Walmart, uh, Lowe's, any uh, place like that. But a lot of people on their canes, they once they prune, they will take a little drop of that glue, drop it on there, rub it across the top. And what that does, that forms a seal over the end of canes. So cane borers, that's a wasp looking uh, uh, insect. If you ever see a hole down in the middle of a cane, that's where a cane borer has drilled a hole to lay an egg. And once that egg hatches, it the little worm or the little um, uh, cane borer grows and it eats the pith of that cane as far down as it needs it before it's big enough to come out. Once it comes out, that cane's going to usually die all the way down to where it ate the pith out of the middle. So people use the uh, sealer on top of the canes to do that. I did that one year, I told my wife, we, have about, we had about 100 roses at the time. I said, Denise, I'm going to prune the roses and you come out here and you just take this glue. All you've got to do is take this glue and put a drop over the canes. And uh, when that's all you got to do. So we did. On 100 rose bushes, you can talk about four to six to eight canes on every one. Well, that's the week that we had that freeze and the canes died down. And I had to reprune them. 
Denise said, if you think I'm going back out there and putting glue drops on those, you are out of your mind. So we've never done that again. We let the uh, cane borers have what canes they want and we take the rest, but we don't have that many cane borers. So. But if you, if you want to do that to yours, you, you please do. And if you want to call Denise to get uh, uh, recommendations on how to do that, she'll be more than happy to tell me. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I'm looking forward to see, hopefully seeing some of you on our uh, uh, roster of new members. Again, Kathy's email, if you were at Thursday's meeting and did not uh, get your email address, we didn't get your email address, we forgot it. Kathy's email address is Kathy Ann Owen, C-A-T-H-Y-A-N-N-O-W-E-N at gmail.com. Okay. Thanks again, Jimmy. This has been great. And uh... Thank you. We hope to see everyone out in the gardens. It's going to be a spectacular year this year. Uh, I think it's what, what we all needed. Um, yes. So yes. everyone have enjoy your weekend and stay safe out there. Thank you, John. Thank you for hosting this. Oh, yeah, Appreciate absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. Time. Bye. Bye.